Welcome to this Univap talk about what's coming up next after the delivery of the flight hardware to the NASA High Time mission and what's coming up next uh, from Hawaii Space Flight Laboratory. And uh, with us today, uh, our guests are uh, here uh, Miguel Nunes, who is the Deputy Director of uh, Hawaii Space Flight Laboratory. We have Søren Pedersen, our uh, Space Cloud Sales Manager. And uh, next to me is Fredrik Brun our chief evangelist. And my name is Matthias Persson. I'm VP of space here at Unibat. So let's get started and talk about what's on the horizon after the NASA high time mission. Miguel, um, you just took delivery of this nice piece of hardware. And um, could you tell us a little bit more about what that means for the mission and for your upcoming ones after this? Okay, uh, so indeed we received the Univap flight computer uh, just a few months ago, and that was an incredible feat of the Univap team in working together for about two years on putting this hardware together. And now we have it in our clean room, uh, integrated with most of the other subsystems, and it's been running flawlessly uh, for about two or three months now, um, nonstop. So it's great to see that hardware um, finally coming together. We are uh, connected to the uh, payloads and to the radios uh, that uh, are, you know, going to transmit all the data uh, for the high time mission. And we're running uh, tests uh, pretty much every day. So uh, it's a great place to be. Uh, in terms of what's next, so we are uh, going through the motion of integration and testing for a lot of the uh, subsystems for high tide. Uh, delivery is expected this fall and launch in the spring of 2022. And uh, Frederick, uh, you've been working with this heterogeneous compute architecture for many years, uh, starting out uh, 2013 and onwards. And uh, this must be a bit of a peak uh, we are at right now, having this hardware going into space and um, accomplishing great things on a, on a NASA mission. Absolutely, and I think this collaboration with Hawaii Space Flight is fantastic uh, because you are really pioneering the way we do science. And I do believe, and please elaborate on that, that this mission will actually potentially transform the way NASA is viewing scientific missions as well, bringing parts of the intelligent analysis into the orbit. Because traditionally, scientists love to get raw data, all of it, every single bit, and they don't want anyone to touch that data in between. And here it's being a hybrid model, and it, it's really changing the way you can do analytics in space if you're open to it. Exactly. HITAI is a tech demo mission, and one of the key elements of this mission, there's three elements, but one of them was the uh, heterogeneous computer capability. And so that's that's one reason why we got funded for, for this mission. And uh, it's really key to NASA and to the scientists to be able to acquire uh, large amounts of data, and, and it, it's it's that interest of acquiring data is growing exponentially as we get better detectors and, and whatnot. But also to, to transfer that data to, to the ground, either by doing onboard processing or just direct download. So these the, the acquisition, the data processing, and the data transfer are yeah. really key to future NASA missions and science missions that can only be achieved by using computers uh, like the Unibap, the DIX5 and IX10, and etc. So, um, it's th this technology is absolutely key for new missions that are coming up down the pipeline. So, Soren, uh, you have been working in the CubeSat industry for a long time, and 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 sort of see that from the very beginning, and. Uh, how do you see this new capability of having uh, 
enormous compute power available also down to the smallest CubeSat of uh, six use or maybe even below that, but you have a limitation of power, I assume. Well, from my point of view, it's it's going to be a game changer, basically. Uh, it's not going to, uh, say, uh, drastically uh, change the way that large uh, Earth observation missions uh, function, but <clears throat> it's maybe going to optimize uh, the, those Class A type missions. But but for smaller, uh, more dedicated science missions, where you're looking at maybe specific spectral bands, where you're looking at uh, collecting this on orbit and then trying to uh, maybe work on a on a limited budget uh, and and maximize your science output, there's definitely a large potential to develop smart algorithms uh, to do this uh, in in terms of uh, filtering data in terms of uh, selecting only uh, science data of interest, but also to maybe just look at the metadata in that context. And and this is a place where we haven't really been before. So I'm I'm really thrilled for this uh, and, and to see it all coming together. And uh, Miguel, uh, this mission is is uh, kind of just the start of the potential of. Um, having uh, new applications or, or updated applications uh, uh, deployed during the mission lifetime in a way that we haven't seen before. Uh, so the space cloud platform is enabling a completely new way of keeping your mission alive, so to say, or, or bring new capabilities to your mission along the road. Yes, absolutely. So um, one of the interesting features that we can deploy with such an architecture is that you can reconfigure your data processing algorithm uh, on the fly pretty much or you can re-upload something that is very capable so not only different machine algorithm uh, implementations but also you know uh, you want to compress the data indifferently or do do various things so the capability and the flexibility that it enables you is uh, is something very interesting to explore, um, which is something we actually will be experimenting with uh, HITAI once it's in space. So there's a few algorithms that we have uh, selected and working with, and then we will be doing exactly that, uploading a new algorithm to do the data processing to get a slightly different result uh, at, at the user end. Um, so, for instance, if you want to, you know, target, say, a, a hot spot like a fire uh, on the ground or, say, uh, a volcano that just erupted, you know, you would have different uh, algorithms that would detect uh, those features and, and send maybe even a text message back to you uh, saying, OK, there's something of interest here. Changing between those algorithms is something that is not possible with current architectures. So the Unibat architecture allows us to do that. This is uh, more or less the first first time that uh, uh, capability like this is deployed uh, for for different um, purposes of uh, providing actionable information and higher level data products directly from the satellite. And you mentioned sending text messages and that sounds like you use not uh, standardized uh, uh, ground station passes it seems like you have to have some kind of more uh, uh, available uh, network to to send those mes messages through mm -hmm. correct so uh part of our architecture communication architecture is to use the global star constellation uh to be able to send uh, these minimal data packets uh to the user in almost real time. Uh, there's Iridium, there's other possibilities there, so uh, it's not limited to Global Star. But um, it, it, one more one more time, I stress the importance of why Dunabap uh, is critical to this mission is because by ingesting all of that data and then processing all of that data and then extracting the interesting feature that you want, so L, L0 to L2 uh, data processing on boards allows you to do that, uh, which the L2 data is so compact, uh, it exactly has the information that you're looking for, so it can be sent in a few bytes rather than hundreds of gigabytes, right? Um, so 
once you have that information, then it's a matter of just transporting that information to the ground as quickly as possible. So first responders or whoever is interested in that information can get it as soon as possible. And then later, you download the raw data to reconfirm if the onboard processing uh, algorithm is doing the correct thing. Uh, but at least you have an early warning. So you can now actually prioritize the queue of data being downloaded also to the most important data. Correct. So we, we store the L0 level data uh, on board for later confirmation on the ground. Uh, we store the L1 uh, level and we, of course, send and transmit the L2, which is very, very small compared to the other two. Uh, so at least, and that's part of the, the tech, no, tech demo is we want to not only do the, the validation on the ground, we want to do the validation in space and then demonstrate some minimal uh, uh, operational capability. High time, <clears throat> excuse me, high time mission being a trailblazer is fantastic. How quickly could you redo it if you would do it again? So high tie is obviously <laughs> the first unit, so that takes more time. But if you would do this again and deploy other kind of applications for another mission, how quickly could you do that, you believe? If I can scratch the pandemic variable and the global chip supply issues, uh, I think we could do it in less than a year, honestly, um, and possibly faster. So it actually the bottleneck at this point would be the vendor supply uh, process. So the procurement process, that would be the bottleneck. But in terms of uh, putting the technology back together, if I had all the components in place, uh, pretty confident that in four to six months, we could uh, be ready for, for launch. I guess then uh, that Saren's dream of rapid development and integration of products will become true soon because you can tailor missions on a fairly short time scale and uh, launch them. And once they are in orbit, you can also repurpose them during the mission. And that should change Absolutely. also the economics of space. Absolutely. Yes. I agree. Um, one of the key things, too, that is happening is that we are getting uh, more and more efficient power on, uh, and when I say is, is electrical power in space, which is also enabling these uh, computing uh, capabilities in space because they go hand in hand. Uh, um, so the technology has advanced very, very quickly in the storage capacity and the power production capacity and the compute capacity, uh, which is enabling you know, more operational capability to keep a computer like this one. So uh, I also have another question for you, Miguel, uh, relating to uh, the high tie mission. Are you going to see changes in the way you do missions operations as well because of this new infusion of technology or will that mostly stay the same? Uh, good question. Um, the payload, the, the Unibap right now for Hightai is being used as the payload uh, computer. It's dedicated to that. So uh, the actual use telemetry and control of the, the satellite is, is handled by a lower level computer um, provided by ISIS space. And so what would be interesting though, uh, which our, our tech demo is not necessarily looking into is could you merge, you know, the, the, the operational capability with the payload processing capability. So therefore just having one uh, computer in space or maybe redundant, uh, you know, computer in space. So that is absolutely something uh, very interesting to, to look into. Uh, but high tide is not necessarily uh, doing that, but I can see in the future, especially if uh, CubeSats continue to expand in terms of their uh, interest and capability, uh, the volume constraints is so critical that you definitely want to reduce the number of components you have while increasing their reliability. Uh, so as a systems engineer and a 
technology developer, I would like to see something like that happen. Um, yeah. So if you look at the pure performance of, of the existing uh, flight hardware for, for the high time mission, and looking forward, do you think that is sufficient uh, uh, compute performance, or do you foresee that you would need orders of magnitudes higher compute performance for your missions in the future? That is the question you never want to ask a scientist. You want more on board computer <laughs> capability uh, <laughs> because they will always tell you, yes, I need 10 times more of what you can give me already. But it um, comes with a cost normally. Uh, yes. It could be power, it could be something else, right? So. Right. Uh, so, but it's absolutely true. The, the, the needs are growing so quickly that uh, there is already a demand uh, from our group, I, I cannot speak for other groups, but uh, where we would like to see the next uh, generation of the computer in place, which is equivalent to the you know the IX10 and maybe future architectures that you're uh, thinking about. So, in in particular, we're interested in larger arrays for the detectors, uh, so in faster frame rates. So right now, Hitai uses a 6 4 by 520 array, and the next generation array uh, is going to be a, a 1K by 1K, and then you can imagine later 2K by 4K. So, And then the other thing is the frame rate. So with Hitai, we're running at about 140 hertz, uh, give or take, and uh, the next generation we're looking into of these arrays can provide up to 1,000 hertz, so you can just imagine the scale in just the next generation of data is is just monstrous uh, compared to what we're dealing with already. So, um, and if it's possible to ingest all that data and process that data, you can enable science that hasn't been able to be done before, therefore the appeal. And I find this fascinating because as a scientist myself, I know that scientists really love to get their hands on raw data. But what you just described is that the satellite sensors will produce so much data that it's physically impossible to transmit that data back to ground. So we, we really have to infuse onboard analytics to be able to, to do the science. Absolutely. Yes, that, that is without a question absolutely true. Right. And, and in that world of having to, to foresee uh, on-orbit processing of all of this data, uh, it's inevitable to, to, to design a system where uh, if you're looking for a, say, a dynamic uh, evolving uh, scientific goals uh, to have everything on orbit when you launch. So what, what sort of, you're carrying some, some different applications. What, what size are these applications? Are you planning on uploading maybe new ones to the mission uh, once you get going uh, I mean, do you have a like a, uh, a planning of, of what you uh, know that you don't know and then are planning for that in this context uh, let me see if I understood the question so uh, we so we, we are in, in, indeed planning to have uh, different applications uploaded to the spacecraft to change the, the level two data. Um, so that is one thing that is pretty clear that uh, we have planned on. Are we gonna do the same for L, L0 to L1? That is an, another interesting question because that is, uh, usually the algorithm is so closely tied together to the L0 data that if you were to change it, uh, it, it, there, would have, there would have to be a very specific reason for changing it, which would be, you know, your frames are not being uh, properly correlated or there's more noise in the data that you're, you know, looking into. So those would be corrections to the uh, algorithm. Um, now, the L1 to L2 is where you, you have a lot of the application uh, uh level software where you could definitely with a few hundred bytes uh you know or megabytes you would be able to 
change completely the way you're detecting things on the ground or in space for that matter. So I hope that answers the question. I don't know if I got Oh, that. yes. Yeah. Okay. Are you exploring the capability of different applications subscribing to the same uh, sensor data and, and do their sort of different processing tasks? Uh, correct, yes. So that is the, the L level one to level two applications that we have mm -hmm. a few of them in line uh, that will be on board and then we can switch between them and we can also upload uh, new applications and then activate them. So the, the good thing is that these are just, you know, binary files that reside on disk and then you can trigger one versus the other. Um, and it's, it's, it's almost like having your own personal computer app in space. Uh, and this is pretty funny because I keep uh, telling my guys, uh, we can browse the internet on Chrome and Firefox on, in space. So let's see if we can <laughs> make a demo of internet browsing in space. Uh, <laughs> um, but yes, it's uh, a joke aside. Um, it's fairly easy to, to actually do this with a Unix or Linux based architecture uh, that the Unibat provides. Do you think that based on the results that you, you and your team are creating, that the solicitations from NASA and other uh, entities will change and start to demand these kind of capabilities in the future? I certainly hope so. Uh, we, I, I'm not in this, the the NASA side, um, I can relay what I hear and talk with people, but uh, I, there's going to be, it's like CubeSats, when they started, nobody really cared much for CubeSats, it was just really a niche for universities and smaller groups, but they have become so important that uh, big organizations and uh, agencies like NASA they're now heavily investing in that. I think the paradigm shift of having an embedded computer uh, with a microcontroller to do a mission, which is the standard, to having, say, your personal computer capability up in space is, is, a, is a paradigm shift. And so I expect the same thing to happen slowly you know, these technologies will infuse the organizations and they will start to see the benefit of them, uh, especially now with the advent of machine learning and people wanting to do machine learning on board in space. It's just going to uh, grow, I think, exponentially. So I think we're just at that uh, curve uh, where we're starting to see those uh, uh, capabilities in demand. Have you, apart from all the environmental testing and other things that we are checking before launch, uh, have you seen any regulatory issues that you had to work through by bringing intelligence into space? Nope, uh, not as far as we are aware. So, so far, so good. Good question. Interesting question. So uh, this being a science mission uh, for Earth observation, uh, how do you see on future missions going to uh, to the Moon, uh, to Mars, and, and maybe beyond, using this type of technology or, or bringing intelligence on board? Yes, um, even more so. So there's a lot of Earth-based applications that we have been thinking for many years there, they will be happening in the next decade or so. But as you're starting to try to explore more of the moon, more of, uh, you know, different regions of the deeper space, uh, you don't have that ability to react very quickly when you're very far away. And therefore, again, you want to have an algorithm on board where it's ingesting that data from your camera or radar or whatever and you're going to be, be, be making decisions in real time uh, on the spacecraft on whether you want to uh, change uh, directions or you want to 
survey a particular area and things like that. So not only in flight, but also on the ground uh, where rovers uh, and other exploratory vehicles will, will require that onboard capability, or onboard intelligence, really. So um, I think that's probably the next big step for these heterogeneous architectures is to go into the deep space and start to explore the moon. Uh, so for instance, we are uh, working on a, a lunar high tide concept, which would basically uh, survey the moon um, in uh, unprecedented resolution, like it's never been done before. And that could characterize all the minerals and all the, you know, the water concentration that we have on the moon. So uh, if and that is only possible with, again, ingesting a lot of data and processing a lot of data on board. Um, so that, that's one very immediate application that we're already looking into, but I can imagine missions to Mars, to, to other planets, where you're gonna to need to do something very similar. It sounds amazing. We are getting close to the top of the hour here, so we need to, begin to wrap up. Uh, Søren, would you like to begin with some famous last words? No, I'm just happy to see uh, what uh, the high time mission is doing for Earth observation missions in general and how they are sort of uh, trailblazing in terms of bringing and utilizing processing capability on orbit. Uh, that, that's really a joy for me to see. Excellent. And Miguel, if I would ask you the same, any famous last words? Keep dreaming the future. You guys are doing an incredible job. Um, let's keep working on what is the next uh, incredible computer architecture and make applications for space work in ways that have never been imagined before. Thank you very much. And uh, I can only conclude that we seem to have a digital dream together. So we let's have. go and explore uh, digital transformation at a higher level in space. Absolutely. And Matthias, if yeah. you would like to wrap this up. Thank you very much for all of your contributions here and, and wisdom. Um, with that, I think I would like to close the Unibap talks for today and uh, see you around for tomorrow. Thank you.